Hello everyone and welcome back. In this video we're going to cover multiple subjects from the system overview. We're going to talk about the lockout chip and we're going to go over the CPU overview. So with that said, let's do this. All right, so before we start, we're going still using the Nerdy Night uh, source. I'm using the Nerdy Night Mirror website. And in the previous video, which it, this is a continuation from, uh, went I went over a basics computer overview, a little bit of NES with this part over here. But now we're gonna continue off and start with our system overview from here. So let's do that part. And here you have the same diagram as the Nerdy Night website. I just did a little bit of a redesign as you see over here and a little a minor changes as well. So let's go over them. So first I have the top NES, which can respond to the NES console and the bottom is the cartridge, that's the card. And uh, let's go over the minor changes that I did. As you see over there, it says Ryko 2A03 that the NTSC, NTCS uh, output is the 60 frame per second frame rate for the North American version. The European version is the to A07 and that displays 50 frames per second and it's, and it's this almost the same chipset except that one the frame rate and a little bit of a division difference but uh, essentially the same and you'll see them all in the same box because the APU and the CPU together so whenever you open a NES console the CPU and APU is going to be on the same chipset so that's something to keep in mind as you see over there Another component you see to the left is the PPU, which the CPU talk to them through memory mapping. It's gonna be the topic of the next video. And the PPU, of course, handles all the graphics, which will be displayed by the TV. That's why you have the arrow pointed into the TV. And also the controller talks to the CPU. And it also have its own memory mapping location. Oh. And the next and the last components for the NES, as you see over here, is the lockout chip, which both the cartridge and the NES have. So they talk to each other just to make sure you have a licensed and authentic game running. Well, a form of security system. So what else have we got? We have the character ROM or RAM. Some cartridge added more extra RAM so you can have more backgrounds to it. And that is where all the graphics Lays and it's going to talk directly to the PPU. And then you have the program memory, or P PRG, as you see over here, that contains all the logic for a game or the code. So most of the code is going to be here, and the character and all the sprites and whatnot is going to be in the character. And now we have on the option part, which you have over here WRAM, which means workable RAM. So some characters can have extra RAM. And on the right, you see over here that I have a SRAM, which means static RAM. And static RAM is a form of uh, RAMs made by transistors. It is faster and consumes less electricity than DRAM, which is dynamic RAMs, which is composed by, uh, I believe it's what? It's not transistors. And the other one is capacitors. Yes, capacitors which needs to be refreshed. So as you see, SRAM is ideal over here. And I'm gonna show you a picture of a PCB of the NES that has a SRAM written to it. So like, hey, this is SRAM. In reality, it's both a type of workable RAM. And some other cartridge PCBs, of course, you see here optional. You don't have to have the workable RAM, it does have the other option is you have a battery. And as I mentioned before, RAM is a volatile memory. So if the power goes off, you lose all the memory. So in order to save all your data, what the idea was to just have this battery, keeping the power on forever, well, as long as the battery lasts. So we have all your save files in your cartridge. So that's when you see games like I mean, all the Nintendo games from NES, Game Boy, Super Nintendo, that was the uh, saving method that they used. And 
of course, you don't really need to have a battery. You can just have the extra WRAMs for other whatever memory, uh, extra memory that you need for your game. If you feel like you need it, you can access and use it as well. So that's all the components that you can see from this diagram. So let's talk about the lockout chip. And if you saw the diagram before, I, you saw that both the NES and the cartridge has a lockout chip. And the main function of the lockout chip, well, besides the security, of course, is controls the reset method. So how it all works is that the NES sends a stream of integers between the value 0 and 15. So it's some hex value, so it takes four bits, right? And it sends the number to the cartridge, and the cartridge has a lookup table, so it gets the number. And both of them do some complex computation. And then they compare each other values, and it, if both of them are correct, uh, things should go smoothly. Uh, if it doesn't, then it means that uh, something is wrong, and then the system is going to be in a constant resetting loop. So that's one way. So let's say, for example, all right, so let me just remove this chip over here or just cut the four bits, the four pins that correspond for the four bits for the for this console. Let's say just, just remove it, right? So now the cartridge is there just waiting for the ID to show up, which never happens. So the console itself is not, never reset. So that's how they implement the system so it can only run official games. Uh, over time, it got defeated. Uh, they just use large voltage spikes to send to the to the NES lockout chip, and they managed to find some vulnerability and hacked it. So this pretty much just over overflow the the system itself. And if you actually have ever read the, how the PS3 first got uh, hacked, it pretty much they did the same thing. They just send a spike over there over the thing, some overflow happens, some security breach, and then they manage to uh, access the, the lockout, well, the system itself through the lockout. So, but that's how the lockout chip works. And of course they revise it. So once they find a security breach, they fix it. So now let's go over the CPU overview. And in the RICO chip inside of the NES, that has two components, a PU and a CPU. And the CPU part is a Moda 5 6502. And if you come in from my previous tutorial series about the Atari 2600, it is pretty much the same processor. But in overview for those people that haven't, it is a 8-bit data processor. And if you ever see the schematic of it, it's probably say an O next to the processor, meaning output. So 8 bit or 1 byte. The index will correspond to two hex values. So it goes from 0, max is going to be FF, or from 0 to 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So 8 ones all together. So 1 byte. Uh, and of course, that is not only. Uh, used for the Atari 2600, but also for the Apple II and then Commodore 64 and some other systems that uh, we'll probably go over. And not only if you see the schematics, you see the 8-bit or the 8 lines for the for the output, you're going to see 16 lines, and that is for the, in that case, we're going to see an A for address, meaning that if you connect, make all the dots, 2 to the power of 16, is going to correspond to 64 kilobytes. And within that range of kilobytes, that's where our memory mapping is going to come. And that's where our 2 kilobytes of CPU of RAM is going to come. That's how you can use your ports for the PPU, for the APU, for the controllers. That's how we can access and use our workable RAM. And that's how we can access and use our program ROM, which in total thinks 32 kilobytes of program ROM. And if you came from my previous uh, tutorial series uh, on the Atari 600, in that case, the maximum size we had is was a 4 kilobyte instead of 32. So as you see, it's already a big jump from this next generation. 
but that was small for them back then. And so S32 became small. So in order to get more memory, not only for the program, but also for the characters. In the Atari 2600, we use a method to use bank switching. And in NES, we're, we're going to do bank switching as well. But in this case, it's going to be in the form of a firmware, meaning there's a chipset inside of it. Well, there was a chipset inside of the of the Atari 600 PCB2. But on the NES, we call them mappers. And there's plenty of different types. Uh, the most popular was one was the MMC3, which was on the Super Smash Bros. 3. You have MMC1, 2, those were for Nintendo's most popular use. So that is going to be our form of bank switching. And But the MMC3 allow 512 kilobytes of program ROM, or space, whatever you can call it, and 256 of character memory. So it increased the limitation of it. All right, so that's pretty much it for this video. In the next video, I'm gonna go over the PPU, at least the overview part of it. Uh, might be another 10 minutes video because I also included uh, how a CRT TV works, oh, at least slightly, a brief overview as well. And uh, that's for the next video. It's still gonna be section two, like I said on the previous video, that's pretty much a split up this video into multiple ones in the next part on the next video should i say this is going to be the graphic system overview and i'm going to use the massive emulator to show you all these different aspects about it and uh, if you like this video and how this series is going too far uh please feel free to subscribe if you're this far into this video and uh we follow that said thanks for watching and i'll see you guys in the next one bye guys Thank you.